Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Dimitri Kleiner. I work at uh, Contentful as Solutions Architect. Um, and yeah, the talk is called CMS as Code. So it's uh, perhaps a little bit orthogonal to the kind of static site generation uh, topic um, because uh, uh, the CMS part kind of comes before the static site generation. So, uh, come, so to use static in this approach, you like you, you make the CMS, you call the API at build time, and then you generate your static site. But this is about this part that comes before you generate your static site when you are when you're doing when you're doing the actual content management and how to do that in a continuous delivery um, infrastructure as code kind of environment. How many people know what continuous delivery is? How many people know what infrastructure as code is? Less people. Cool. Well, you will know about that shortly. Um, yeah, so Contentful API for CMS makes it possible to treat your CMS as code, which is, uh, which is really um, an approach that makes a lot of sense to people that are doing static site generation in general, because static site generation want to treat the whole site as code, right? There's a bunch of static files in a, in a Git repository that gets pushed up to um, a static site host and then doesn't have any kind of dynamics at runtime, right? So I guess everybody here knows what a static site is, right? I'd imagine. I mean, maybe you just came here to learn. I don't know. Um, right. So uh, to talk about continuous delivery and infrastructure as code, I like to use Keith Morris's uh, concept of the Iron Age. So those of us who are old enough to remember the Iron Age, remember when infrastructure was growth was limited by the hardware purchasing cycle, right? So you had to actually go and purchase a server, and that meant like going through all kinds of bureaucracy with your enterprise, and then you would put out, and then you would put an OS on it, right? So there was little pressure to rapidly install and configure software, right? You could take a long time to deploy a new server, right? But then now in the cloud age, right, systems are deployed using cloud services, right? Like infrastructure as code, platform, I mean, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, etc. Everybody knows what all that stuff is, right? Yeah. So uh, you know, so uh, people have also used terms like livestock versus pets, right? Where like in the in the old days, a server was like a pet. It had a name. You kind of like individually built it and configured stuff on it, uh, and you really cared about it. Um, nowadays, uh, servers are like livestock. You mass provision them and you mass execute them whenever uh, you know whenever, whenever you like, right? So, so in the Iron Age, software development was built around box software. Uh, it was expensive, time-consuming release process. You build everything, then test everything, and then release. Right? Very, it's very slow. These days, agile teams release changes frequently. Right? Continuous integration, continuous delivery means you're you're pushing out changes to your production system frequently. And so, expensive and time-consuming release processes can't be used without grinding development process to a start. Right? So to a stop. I mean. Right? And so continuous delivery was, uh, was an approach uh, that evolved to solve this problem. A typical continuous delivery, so yeah, so teams that employ continuous delivery have a deployment pipeline, which is a set of validations that your code passes through um, on the way to production. The pipeline has different stages, each of which have their own environments, right? So it ends up looking kind of like this, where like developers push code to, um, to a software repository, it gets built, it goes to a test system, it, get, it goes to user acceptance testing, and it finally goes to production. But it's not only source code that goes down the pipeline, because for the source code to run, it requires attached resources, infrastructure, right? In classically, things like databases and other services as well. So if you're using a CMS, uh, you know, for instance, to, to, to power your static site build, your, your, your content is also such an attached service, right? So, so these, these little database tubs here could also represent your content repository, right? And so as the number of services the, team, the teams operate grow, it became unmanageable to like go through the Amazon UI and manually click and configure all of these environments, right? It's not only unmanageable, but it also creates what Marty Fowler calls snowflake servers, servers that are in kind of some indeterminate state because they haven't been configured by code. They haven't been provisioned by code. So infrastructure, infrastructure as code is a technique that developed to deal with this. So you don't just go in and you say, here's my development environment, it has this. Here's my QA environment, I'm gonna make this server and that server, and you do it all manually through the UI. You write scripts that provision these environments and you store these scripts in your source code with version control. So a given version of your source code uh, um, has the scripts necessary to provision and build the environment that it needs to run. That all makes sense? Great. And so 
But in CMS, there's two kinds of things that are happening at the same time. And this we find to create confusion, right? There's, there's pipelines and workflows. So there's two life cycles that are happening at once. While software developers are developing software and pushing out new versions of the software, at the same time, content editors are creating content and pushing out new versions of the content, right? So, so, so software developers are creating new iterations of the software, which needs to go down the deployment pipeline, but at the same time, you have the editorial team making new versions of, of the content. And that also has its own life cycle because you have you have content reviewers that need to like review the content, you have review stages in the, in the content publishing process. And because these two things happen at the same time, it becomes confusing, right? Uh, so developers, so in, 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 the, in the deployment pipeline, developers commit new versions of software, QAs test the software, and then software is deployed to production, right? Meanwhile, in the editorial team, authors are creating new content, editors are reviewing the content, and the content is published, right? And all developers think they're kind of like Felicity Smoke. They're like really like, you know, awesome. Uh, they never make any bugs. All the code works perfectly. They always save the day, you know. But QAs kind of have a different opinion on the quality of the code that's being committed. And so they want to have a tight, tight control over the pipeline. They don't want, they, they don't want code to go, go into production before it's tested. And this is similar on the editorial side where, you know, all authors think they're Virginia Woolf, right? They're writing beautiful prose. It's always perfect. But you know, editors think differently. They want to. They want to make sure they control the stuff that's going to production, right? They want to. They want to. They want to check it to make sure that it's that it's okay, right? So while QA's goal is to prevent devs from ever deploying any software, the editor's goal is to crush the author's dreams, right? And so you need to keep these separate, right? Because if, because you need to let authors and editors publish independently of devs and QAs. Because if you mix these two things, it becomes an even further nightmare, and you'll never release anything. You'll never release either software or, or content. It'll, it'll, your, your, your deployment cycle will be so long if you mix these pipelines. So what you end up with is something like this. Right, what you end up with is, is on the, I know my drawings are beautiful. Um, what you uh, end up with on the, on the horizontal plane here, you have an example of a continuous uh, delivery pipeline or deployment pipeline. It can have more stages, but there's three stages here, for example, right? And then you see you have the develop developments, QA, and production. And that is for that is how your software goes to production, right? That's that's only for your software. But when you make changes to your software, you're also often making changes to your content model, right? So the content model, how your CMS works, like the kinds of the, the kind of content types you have, the fields in those content types, etc., that changes. Like when you add features to a when you add features to a system, it affects the content model. That stuff always goes up the pipeline. But content has a different life cycle. But your actual CMS content should only ever be in production. And your editors and QAs should not even know about the existence of these previous spaces. You should, use, you should, have, you should have a preview version or a delivery version of your actual final CMS. So if you're building a static site, you should build to a preview site, let the, review, let the reviewers edit there, and then trigger a publish to the real site. It should always be with your production content and with your, and with your production software. Never like, never like give QAs, like connect, connect your preview to your QA application, right? Because then you're gonna mix those workflows, right? You wanna, you wanna keep those workflows absolutely separate, right? To the degree that you need to have content in the earlier environments, like if you wanna have some content to test QA or test development, backport it. Get it from production, snapshot it, backport it. But production content isn't even always your best test content because QAs, want to have content that will stress test your software. They want to publish a Russian novel in a name field and they want to leave stuff out and like, you know, and, and you know, you know, put in all kinds of like emoji and, 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 and really trying to break your software. So production content isn't necessarily even the content you want on QA on, on, on QA and dev. You might want to have specially made content that you that you know that you bootstrap QA spaces with in order for testing. But the main thing is content models always go to production. Up the, up the delivery pipeline, and content, if anything, comes down, never the other way around. <coughs> so, 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 so you have to write migrations, so you, you store your content model as code when you, when you, commit, your, when, when you commit your code, 
you store your content model and you write a migration for it so that when you push that up to the next level, that migration runs and that modifies the content model to the model that's required for this version of the software. And that's stored with the version of the software. And then once the QAs check that out and make sure that it works, then that goes to production. And only then the real editors actually are able to add, edit content there at that stage, right? And when you're creating content models, it's always, try to, it's always good to try to create a forward migration strategy. Try to avoid making migrations that will invalidate your existing content in one step. So on the first step, always try to add content types and fields, and only after that's been tested, then you can, you can go ahead and then delete content types and fields. Always try to make it so you can have one rollback function, at least one, so you can at least always roll back one stage. Right. Don't make it so once you've changed it, you can't roll back. Because then if you, try to, if you want to roll back your software, you can't go back to that previous version. So try to make up functions and down functions. Make sure your content model changes in such a way that you can support one down function. Right. So, to mig so you migrate space from an older content model. Right. Migrations modify existing entries that are valid according to the current model. And then write tests to verify the current software works with the current content model. So make sure you have tests that, uh, that verify that your new content model isn't going to break anything on your on your application given the production content. Right. So a migration is a very simple script. Like that's a, it's a very simple example. Like say I had a very primitive site that only had one content type called post, and that content type had two fields: one called title, one called author. Well, presumably content as well, but let's ignore that. Um, and then I wanted to create a new version of the site that did something more with author, that had like an author landing page. Then I would write a migration that would separate that out, that would add a new content type and copy all of the authors from the post to the, to the author content type. That should be very clear. Anybody that's done a Rails migration or any migration around databases should be familiar with this kind of content, uh, sort of concept. And like, like with that, try to store your versioning information in the actual space you're migrating because the space should be able to tell you what version it's in. Don't, don't try to store it somewhere else because then you may, uh, have, you may have it wrong and you may run the wrong migration. Right, so content models change, move up the pipeline. Content models should be stored with code. Content when needed moves down the pipeline. Migration scripts migrate content models and content. That's, that's kind of the basics of, of CMS's code. There's another thing that's different. So like if you look at how CMS has evolved over the years, the, uh, in the early versions of CMS, they were kind of, they were kind of like uh, coming from print-based systems and they did a lot of layouts. Like who here has used things like front page or, or Dreamweaver, right? Who still uses those kind of tools? Nobody, right. So the reason for that is because we've realized that layout and, uh, needs to be kept out content management process, that that's a design process and a development process, and we don't do it anymore, right? Um, but, even, but even as we moved away from layout, modern CMSs still confuse content and context. I really hate that these words only have one letter difference, uh, so it can, make, it can make talking about them confusing, right? But CMS's code means authors are out of the design business, and it also means creating content, it, it means, so uh, content creators just write structured data. Right? So data consists of content and context types, and they both go into the content model. This is also complicated from a design point of view, but we have Bruce Lee here to help us understand the difference. Right? Um, you know, it says like water, when you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. When you put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. If you put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Right? You know, so of course the subtext here is that software architects think we're like Bruce Lee. Right? Um, Everybody else kind of thinks differently, right? They kind of think that we're all kind of playing mousetrap. Um, but the main point is, is that content is like water and context is like the teapot, right? And if you think about the structure of, if you the structure of like CMS is like WordPress, they mix that up, right? Like a page is a content type, whereas a page is not content. A page is a context on which you display content. A page is like a teapot. It's not like the water. Uh, a product or an article or a lesson is like, is like, is like content, right? So content types are like product, articles, lessons. That's, that's what content is. And, con and, and context is like a slideshow, a landing page, a featured content block. And so when you're creating a content model, you know, it's not enough just to separate layout you know, from content. You also have to separate context from content. 
Those are different things. And when you're building at, when you're when, when when you're building a content CMS, it'll make it much easier for you to build your application if you separate those things. Especially if you're talking about multi-channel delivery. If you have, for instance, uh, you could have completely different contexts on a smartwatch than you have on a desktop application, right? So if you're so if you're built so if you separate those things, you can still share reusable content across multiple channels if you keep the context if you keep the context clear, right? So CMS's code also mean, it means to separate content from layout, but it means to include content and context in your content model, which sounds like a Dr. Seuss kind of tongue twister, but, uh, um, but uh, it still makes sense once you understand it. So just think, think like Bruce Lee, right? Your content model should resemble your view model. So when you're making your context, like how many people use things like, um, like I get this a static site, uh, crowd, but how many people use things like uh, React or Vue or Riot, uh, Polymer, like any 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 component-based application? If you think about the context part of your content model, then it really looks like your view model. The same thing is true of like templates and partials, right? You can think of those as components as well, right? A template and a partial as a component. So if you have if you have a if you have a if you have a component called slideshow, which is a context. You probably also have a content type called slideshow. If you have, if whatever whatever the properties are of that slideshow class are the fields on your content type, so you can you can directly map them together. And whatever the child classes are of that of that like slide, if you have a slide class that's a sub you know that's meant to be a child class of your slideshow class, then you also have a content type called slide, and you use references, right? So. So you use references to reference content from context. And of course, context can be multi-layered. Like a slideshow has two levels of context, and then finally content. So slideshow, slide, product, or image, or whatever, picture. Right? So, so CMS platforms commonly used today don't work well for agile development practice with infrastructure as code and continuous delivery. And for that same reason, they also don't work very well for static site generation, right? Because for static site generation, you need to have this kind of decoupling. Right, so you know, right. So provisioning, migrating, testing, model of the platform is difficult to automate. You can't automate traditional CMSs the way you can automate, um, you know, API first or static oriented kind of code based, code based things. Right, and separating deployment pipelines from editorial workflows allows devs and authors to work independently. So that's one of the most important parts of the first part. The most important lessons of the first part is that if you separate your deployment pipelines from editorial workflows then you can have both these groups working independently. You can have software developers developing software, content creators creating content, and not running into each other. Right? And separating content and context means, you know, authors don't do layout or design. It fully takes the author now out of the layout and design business, right? So it completely separates it. So when an author is creating, is cre is creating content, they're creating an idea, like a lesson or an article or a picture. They're not, they're not creating a page Right or, or or something like that. That's context, and in a, in your content management should, should allow your authors to add that, but that should be defined by the designers and developers as to what contexts are available to link content from. I think I must be, yeah. So an API first of course CMS makes this possible, which is also great for for uh, static for static sites, which I guess we'll talk about in the panel a little bit, because just because just because you want to go static doesn't necessarily mean that you have to force your editors to like learn Git and Markdown. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can you can still have a CMS with an interface because it's API first. You can call it a build time, generate your static sites, and so we like to think that Contentful is a CMS for the cloud age, using Keith Morris's original terms. Uh, no, that's it. That's it. Thank you.